distinguished guests and participants, thank you very much for joining us today to commemorate the launching of Future Leaders Declaration on ASEAN-Japan Cooperation for International Marine Plastic Waste. My name is Fujiko Amano, Head of Research and Policy Analysis Cluster of ASEAN-Japan Center, and it is my great pleasure to be your MC today. Before we start, ASEAN Japan Center, AJC, is an international organization established by the treaty between the governments of Japan and ASEAN member states, and we promote trade, investment, and tourism between ASEAN and Japan. Since last November, AJC has engaged in this program with 22 future leaders who are university students from 10 ASEAN member states and Japan. Today's declaration is a starting point for these future leaders. AJC would like to continue supporting and empowering them for a long-term period with a vision that these future leaders will implement their aspirations in the society and change the world. Due to the present situation, we are holding the event today as hybrid, and apologies if in advance for any technical issues that may disrupt the program, and we appreciate your patience and understanding. Without further ado, please allow me to turn to our first program. It is our honor and privilege to present the Future Leaders Declaration today, and we would not have been able to do so without the enormous support we receive from our respective governments, ASEAN and Japan. We open today's celebration with the video message for opening remarks received from His Excellency Dato Lim Jok Hoi, Secretary General of ASEAN Secretariat. His Excellency Masataka Fujita, Secretary General of the ASEAN Japan Center, Professor Kajita Takaaki, Nobel Laureate in Physics, distinguished delegates from Japan and ASEAN member states, excellencies, young leaders from the academia and public sector, and ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I'm, I'm pleased to take part in this launching the Future Leaders Declaration on the ASEAN-Japan Cooperation for International Marine Plastics Waste. My appreciation goes to the ASEAN-Japan Center for convening this program despite the challenges posed by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. I would also like to commend the government of Japan for supporting this important initiative which provides an essential platform for our future leaders to engage in discussions on regional and global environmental issues. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we are at a critical juncture in the conservation and management of our shared ocean resources. Ocean-based industries and resources are key drivers for economic growth. The region's sustainable coral reef fisheries alone are worth US $2.4 billion per year. As such, our maritime resources are vital in sustaining life and livelihoods, especially for our coastal communities, which is estimated to reach around 500 million people in ASEAN by 2050. Nevertheless, our oceans are facing considerable risk and pressure. The challenges of overfishing, coastal development, 
and climate change are compounded by increased marine debris pollution. According to the first ocean assessment, marine debris pollution is becoming one of the fastest growing threats to the health of the world oceans. The COVID-19 pandemic has also magnified the existing threat of plastic waste. Since the global outbreak of the virus in 2020, 1.6 million tons of plastic waste are estimated to be generated every day, while approximately 3.4 billion single-use face mask face shield are discarded daily. Accordingly, today's launch of the Future Leaders Declaration is a significant opportunity to renew our commitment and mobilize broad public engagement, particularly among the youth in finding mid to long-term solutions to collectively address marine plastic pollution. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the issue of marine plastic debris is transboundary and requires collective efforts and participation of various stakeholders to engage in coordinated action and partnership. This is our key message and is the very heart of the declaration. The declaration also calls for stronger partnership across all sectors and segments of society, especially the youth. This resonates with ASEAN's agenda and commitment as reflected in the Bangkok Declaration on Combating Marine Debris in ASEAN region and the ASEAN Framework of Action on Marine Debris of 2019. Most importantly, this declaration demonstrates the aspiration of the youth leader for more enhanced global and regional efforts, as well as further strengthen legal instruments for addressing public plastic pollutions and preserving the marine environment for the future generations. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the youth is our vital assets. Nearly one third or 223 million people of ASEAN's population is made up of the youth between 15 to 35 years of age. As a digitally savvy, creative and innovative demographic, the youth in particular can serve as a powerful source of idea and energy to bring about positive change to tackle the issue of marine plastic debris. To the youth leader in the audience, I commend your bold determination and efforts in striving towards a vision for clean sea and re remaining united, resilient, and forward-looking in the face of the growing uncertainties. I hope that you continue to build people-to-people -people links and deepen understanding among the youth of ASEAN and the wider ASEAN Plus 3 community to further the development of ecologically sustainable and responsible society. I encourage you to be guided by the insights gained from the informative and comprehensive lecture you have tended, particularly on the importance of science-based evidence. The common challenges collectively faced by ASEAN and Japan, as well as the complexities of the marine plastics waste issue. Furthermore, today's young people have greater access to extensive information and connectivity that can offer alternative solution to the global environment, environmental challenges as we face now. Currently, there are 4.66 billion internet users worldwide, 
which is an increase of 160 million people since last since January last year. We must leverage this advantage to generate a global conversation and action on environmental sustainability among your generation. This is the aim of the declaration. Indeed, this vision also complements the region's collective efforts to build back better and clean, cleaner, as outlined in the ASEAN Com Comprehensive Recovery Framework and its implementation plan adopted by the ASEAN leaders in November 2020. This framework highlights the strategy to achieve a swift and robust recovery from COVID-19, which include call for the promotion of green and sustainable growth, as well as a, the broad engagement of stakeholders by embracing the meaningful and equal participation of the youth. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my hope is that our youth will be inspired by future leaders of our region to bring about transformational way to co collaboratively innovate and shape the diverse the discourse of regional cooperation in the years ahead for a better world. To this end, I wish to commend Japan, one of our closest neighbors and important partners to especially ASEAN and especially ASEAN Japan Center for choosing this very important initiative as well as providing a platform for future leaders to engage in discussion on regional and global environmental issues. ASEAN and Japan would not be able to battle marine debris alone. Therefore, I truly appreciate the support from Professor Kajita Taka Kaki and the wide part participation of ASEAN and Japan youth. I look forward to witnessing continued engagement and more innovative action to implement the declaration. I'm confident that with all your support, we are getting closer to our vision of a better world with clean oceans that are free of marine plastic debris. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you Your Excellency Dato Lim Jok Hoi, thank you very much for your profound encouragement to our future leaders as well as to the youth in the world. We will now have a screenshot photo for this session. On the count, three, one, two, three. Today, we also have a respectful representative joining online from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan, Mr. Ippei Nakamura. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Nakamura. Greetings. Thank you. We'll move to session one. In session one, Professor Takaaki Kajita, Nobel laureate in physics, and distinguished university professor at the University of Tokyo will deliver a keynote speech on the topic of perspective on the coexistence of universe, 
mankind, and nature. We are very privileged to have with us the presence of a world-renowned scientist and global thinker, Professor Kajita, not only today, but also we did on November 14, when we, he delivered the keynote speech to open our program that emphasized on the importance of international cooperation in science. Please let us all welcome the Nobel laureate in physics, Professor Takaki Kajita. Good morning. First of all, congratulations for the Future Leaders Declaration on ASEAN-Japan Cooperation for International Marine Plastic Waste. Um, now, um, I would like to talk about the uh, coexistence of the universe humankind and nature. Well, this is a big title to me. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I, well, I can give a inspiring talk. But anyway, let me try. OK. Um, now, I want to show you this slide. This is the image of the history of the universe. Well, the horizontal axis is a time, and the vertical axis is the image on the scale of the universe. Now, um, well, let me. OK, yeah, well, we assume that 13.77 billion years ago, the universe was born probably by some quantum fluctuation. Then, immediately after that, the, this small object incredibly expanded. This era is called inflation. Then after that, the universe gets heated. And therefore, we call this phase as the Big Bang universe. Then after that, the um, universe continue expanding, but rather slowly. And the universe, at the same time, cooled down. So after 375 kilo years, um, the universe became transparent to the photons. Therefore, in principle, we can see the universe at that age. That is, in fact, amazing. Only after 400,000 years, universe can be visible to us. Anyway, um, at that age, uh, there was no star. 
So we, we had to wait another 400 million years for the first generation of the stars. Then after that, um, our um, structure of the universe was formed. And during this 13.8 billion years, the universe evolved. And we are now here after 13.8 billion years. OK, so this is the uh, um, sketch of the present understanding of the universe. So clearly, uh, we understood a lot about the universe. However, we do not understand everything, of course. So let me mention some of the remaining or known big questions in the universe. First of all, we do not know how the universe was born. Well, I said probab probably by quantum fluctuation, but we do not know. Second, why the expansion of the universe is accelerating? Well, in fact, at the end of the 20th century, people discovered that the universe expansion is accelerating. That is quite surprising because, well, we have um, gravity, and gravity acts to, to uh, to, to come closer, everything come closer. Therefore, naturally, universe expansion should be decreasing, uh, slow down. But at the end of the 20th century, people discovered that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And we do not know why. Well, we say that this is due to dark energy. That is a form of the vacuum energy but we do not know what is dark energy. Then related to this question, we have another question. What will be the fate of the far future of the universe? If the universe expansion is accelerating, then maybe in the future, uh, we may not be able to see the, our neighbors, our neighbor galaxies. So we do not know what will be the future of the universe. Number four, what is the dark matter? Well, in the previous slide, I didn't show anything about the dark matter. But we know that without dark matter particles, the present structure of the universe was not formed. On the other hand, we do not know what is dark matter. OK, number five. We, we think that in the Big Bang universe, there were equal numbers of matter and the antimatter particles. But at present, we only see matter particles in the universe. There must be some reason that only matter particles remained in the present day universe, but we do not know. And maybe for this question, neutrinos are relevant, but we have to check. And finally, some people are thinking, is our universe the only one? Well, of course, we do not know the answer. OK, so these are some of the big questions in the universe. Let me continue. <laughs> well, we know that every galaxy has a supermassive black hole at the center, how 
And when these supermassive black holes were formed, we actually we do not know. And I said, um, soon after the uh, creation of the universe, the universe became very big. This period is called inflation. Then, well, this is still a kind of theoretical idea. So we'd like to know if inflation really happened. Then the question is, how can we measure inflation? Now, I want to move on. Um, well, in the universe, there are cosmic rays. They are high energy particles propagating in the universe. How cosmic ray particles can be accelerated up to, say, 10 to 20 electron volts, which is an extremely high energy, approximately 10 to 20 times higher energy than the visible photon or visible light. So this is an Im incredibly high energy part particles, but we do not know how these particles are created. Number four, how heavy metals such as gold or platinum were created in the universe. In the Big Bang universe, of course, protons were created, protons and neutrons were created. Then helium were created. But in the Big Bang, only light, only light particles can be created. Then in the sun or stars, um, due to the uh, nuclear fusion processes, heavier, heavier particles such as oxygen, carbon are created. But the sun cannot produce gold or platinum. Then the question is how these uh, heavy metals were created in the universe. And finally, what is the fate of the heavy stars? Well, in fact, we know that these heavy stars explode at the end of the, their life. This is called a supernova. But, well, at the end of the life of the star, they spent all of the uh, fuel. Therefore, essentially, they collapse due to the gravity. But we observe the explosion. Why this happened? We do not know. So we have many questions in the universe. And to additionally, in order to observe the universe, we use telescopes. And well, traditionally, we, we install telescopes at the surface, typically on the mountain. And this is the uh, Subaru telescope in Hawaii. But, well, of course, if these telescopes are on the surface, these telesco telescopes have the uh, effect of the fluctuation of the atmosphere. Or atmosphere is not transparent for some wavelengths. Therefore, sometimes, we launch the uh, space telescope, as shown in the right. OK, that was the traditional way to study the universe. But in the 20th century, people realized that optical teles telescopes are not the only tools to explore the universe. So. In the next two pages, I want to show you what our institute is uh, contributing to these big questions. Well, the left photo shows the Super Kamiokande neutrino detector. Um, it is a very large underground um, detector. It is about 40 meters in diameter and 40 meters in height. And with this detector, uh, well, by the way, we are, uh, after this photo, we put very clean water into this detector. 
and we'd like to know if neutrinos are responsible for the existence of the matter in the universe. Also, we'd like to understand the supernova explosion by observing neutrinos. And the right photo shows the Kagura gravitational wave detector. In fact, this is only a part of the Kagura interferometer. It is a three kilometer by three kilometer laser interferometer. And anyway, with this interferometer, we direct to observe gravitational waves. And by observing gravitational waves, we direct to know if heavy metals are created by the mergers of binary neutron stars. I'm sorry, <laughs> too many technical words. <laughs> anyway, um, um, also we'd like to understand the history of the black holes in the universe. <laughs> and these are another examples about the uh, cosmic rays. And the left one is the um, experiment to observe very high energy cosmic rays. And these are uh, installed in Utah in United States. And you see a detector here. And another one is here, 1.2 kilometer away. And another one, maybe you cannot see, but another 1.2 kilometer away, and so on. So we, we install these kind of detectors, and we'd like to know where and how the cosmic ray particles are, particles are accelerated up to 10 to 20 electron volts. And the right photo shows the um, experiment to observe very high energy gamma rays. And this is installed in Canary Islands in Spain. And we'd like to know where and how the extremely high energy gamma rays are created. So uh, these are the things we are usually working. Now, I want to think about the universe and the Earth. Knowing the universe, we realize that we are extremely fortunate. I, I talked about the dark energy. And if the dark energy was not the actual value, which is actually not zero, but unnaturally very small, the universe should not survive for 13.8 billion years. And if the solar system existed near to the galactic center, the solar system could receive various effects from the central supermassive black hole and many nearby stars. So the solar system would not survive for 5 billion years. Or if the sun were heavier than the actual one, actual value, this sun's life should be substantially shorter. And therefore, the solar system should, not, should finish the life before we were born. Or if some condition of the solar system was slightly different, liquid water could not exist at the surface of the Earth. And finally, uh, if there were no neutrino, the sun could not shine. So I think it's almost a miracle that we can live on the Earth. And this suggests that we should try to keep the Earth healthy as much as we can. Now, <clears throat> one more thing about our uh, fortunate thing. Um, we are very fortunate that we can study the universe. Now, if we look, at the, uh, look back the history, in the old days, it was not possible to study the universe and present 
what they learned on the universe. For example, if one wants to say that the Earth is orbiting around the sun, that was actually not allowed to say. So we, I think we are really living in a fortunate era. We can study the universe receiving supports from various governments and various people. And typically, the governments and people support these scientific activities, expecting that these studies benefit the humankind. So scientists should not forget that we are working for the humankind. In particular, scientists should not forget that in order to carry out various studies, we have to have a good conditions in the country, region, environment, and so on. So scientists cannot be independent from society. Now, related to the scientist and society, um, I would like to refer the Declaration on Science and the Use of Scientific Knowledge. This is commonly known as Budapest Declaration, which was adopted by the World Conference on Science on July 1st, 1999. Well, the whole document is long. Therefore, I only pick up um, um, a part that could be relevant to us today. In the preamble, uh, they wrote, scientific knowledge has led to remarkable innovations that have been of great benefit to humankind. Life expect expectancy has increased strikingly and cures have been discovered for many diseases. Technological developments and the use of new energy sources have created the opportunity to free humankind from arduous labor. They have also enabled the generation of an, an expanding and complex range of industrial products and processes. Then, uh, in the next uh, paragraph, in addition to their uh, dem demonstrable benefits, the applications of scientific advantage and the uh, development and expansion of human activity have also led to environmental degradation and technological disasters and have contributed to social imbalance or exclusion. Then, again, in the next paragraph, today, whilst unprecedented advantages, uh, advances in the science are foreseen, there is a need for vigorous and informed democratic debate on the production and use of scientific knowledge. And then in the main text, um, there's a section called Science in Society and Science for Society. And in the section, they said, the practice of scientific research and the use of knowledge from that research should always aim at the welfare of humankind, including the production of poverty, uh, red, sorry, reduction of poverty, be respectful of the uh, dignity and rights of human beings and of the global environment, and take fully into account our responsibility toward present and future generations. There should be a new commitment to these important principles by
by all parties concerned. And in the next paragraph, they said, the social responsibility of scientists requires that they maintain high standards of scientific integrity and quality control, share their knowledge, communicate with the public, and educate the younger generation. Political authorities should respect such action by scientists. Okay, this is the uh, part of the um, Budapest Declaration. <clears throat> Clearly, the human activities have become so powerful, in particular in the 21st century. These activities significantly affect the nature on the earth. I think all scientists should recognize this fact and take some responsibility to keep the earth with sustainable environment. I think we should all remember science in society and science for, uh, sorry, sorry, science in society and science for society. So I fully agree with the Budapest Declaration. Now, one of the big problems is the marine plastic waste. As far as I know, marine plastic waste is a very difficult problem. We know that some plastics are extremely useful and cheap. Therefore, there are high demands to produce plastic products. As far as I know, we do not know any efficient ways to reduce them significantly. Clearly, we have to involve as many people as possible to solve this problem, including scientists in various scientific fields. So I'm deeply impressed with the Future Leaders Declaration on ASEAN-Japan cooperation for international marine plastic waste. And I hope that many of the future leaders will continue studying the marine plastic waste and contribute to find the ways to solve this problem. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Professor Kajita, thank you very much for your magnificent and compelling explanations on universe and our miracle of the earth, which greatly stimulate our imagination and also links to the importance of Budapest Declaration. Your keynote speech today makes today's event extremely memorable for our future leaders as well as our audience online. We will now have a screenshot photo for this session. Uh, Professor Kajita, would you like to be at the podium, please? On the count three, One, two, three. One more time. One, two, three. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Kajita, please kindly have a seat. We will now move to session two. Before opening session two, please allow me to call on the six future leaders who represent all the future leaders today 
and who will conduct the reading of the declarations. Ms. Machiko Fujikawa from Japan, studying Bachelor in Resources and Environmental Engineering at Waseda University. Mr. Yuya Yukiya Uchida from Japan, studying Bachelor in Agriculture, Bio Resource and Bioenvironment, Kyushu University. Mr. Bandos Ross from Cambodia, a PhD candidate in economics at Hiroshima University. Ms. Nurala Tifa from Indonesia, studying Master in Chemistry at Kumamoto University. Ms. Nurtifa was one of the members to draft the preamble of the declaration. Ms. Shelby Santoso from Indonesia, studying Master in Environmental and Civil Engineering at Toyama Prefecture University. Ms. Thai Tian Trang from Vietnam, studying Master in Environmental Management at Kyoto University. In session two, the declaration will be launched. In the course of the three preparatory sessions, our future leaders passionately discussed and deliberated on the content of this declaration. The mode of the drafting was as if they were tackling a treaty negotiation, where all of the future leaders evaluated and agreed to each word of this declaration. Thus, in order to reform, reinforce their efforts, we originally wanted all of them to read all of the paragraphs of the declaration. However, regretfully, due to COVID-19 and the time allocation, we could only have the presence of these six future leaders we will read only the preamble of the declaration. Nevertheless, all of the other future leaders, 10 of them at AJC Hall today, and six of them joining online, are equally dedicated and committed. As you can see from their personal statements contained in the back of the declaration. For the audience's information, we have provided the actual text of the declaration when we sent out the link to this event. After the reading, we will have a moment where all the fellows sign the declaration at the same time to commemorate the launch. And two professors, Professor Kajita and Professor Isobe, who guided the future leaders during this program will kindly give their address to congratulate our future leaders. Ms. Fujikawa, please proceed to the podium and begin the launch. We, the young leaders of the academic sector, with candidate degrees from bachelor's to PhDs, and the public sector from the member states of the Association of South Asia, Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, namely Brunei Darussalam, the Kingdom of Cambodia, the Republic of Indonesia, the Lao People's Democratic Republic, Malaysia, the Republic of the Union of Myanmar, the Republic of the Philippines, the Republic of the Singapore, the Kingdom of Thailand, and the Socialist Republic of Vietnam and Japan have been selected by the ASEAN Japan Center to participate in its project entitled 
Future Leaders Declaration on ASEAN Japan, Co ASEAN Japan Cooperation for International Marine Plastic Waste, with the common goal of contributing to tackling the global challenges relating to marine plastic waste and proposing how these challenges should be addressed through a cooperation framework between ASEAN and Japan. We aspire to dedicate ourselves to finding the mid to long term solution to the challenges posed by the issue of marine plastic waste, striving on our exchange of individual expertise and views at the preparatory sessions for this declaration held on the 14th November 2020, 28th November 2020s, and 12th December 2020s, as well as the insights and learning gained regarding the first, the importance of science-based evidence, second, common challenges that collectively faced by the ASEAN member states and Japan, and third, the complexities of the marine plastic waste issues through informative and comprehensive lectures by, among others, Professor Takaaki Kajita of the University of Tokyo, Nobel laureate in physics, and the Professor Atsuhiko Isobe of Kyushu University. We we also greatly appreciate the guidance received from the lecturers in the special seminar held on 20 November with regard to policy perspectives and practical implementation, namely Dr. Wong Sok from the Environmental Division of the Asian Secretariat, Mr. Tatsuya Abe from the Ministry of Environment of Japan, Mr. Shunsuke Nakamura and Ms. Emi Teshima from Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA, Mr. Hiroshi Yasutake from the Kitakishu Center for Asian Low Carbon Society, and Mr. Mitsuru Takeshita from the Japan Clean Ocean Material Alliance. We welcome the government's hidden attention to the issue of marine plastic waste through the inclusion of the term of marine plastic debris in paragraph four of the joint statement of the 23rd uh, ASEAN Japan Summit on Cooperation on ASEAN Outlook on the Indo Pacific or AOIP, dated 12 November 2020 as a possible area for cooperation under the ASEAN-Japan Strategic Partnership in connection with the marine cooperation outline in the AOIP. And we acknowledge and emphasize the realization of the aim and the goals of the 27 ASEAN Declaration on Environmental Sustainability, the commitments made in the 2019 Bangkok Declaration on Combating Marine Debris in Asian Regions, the focus of cooperation in the chairman's statement on the 22nd ASEAN Japan Summit, and the engagement under the 2017 ASEAN Framework of the Action on Marine Debris, and the 2018 ASEAN 3 Plus, Plus 3 Marine Plastic Debris Cooperative Action Initiative. On the basis of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, which defined pollution of the marine environment in Part 1, Article 1, Paragraph 1, Part 4, we are concerned about continuing plastic pollution, including microplastic and microplastics, of the marine environment and its harmful effect on the marine life and human health and recognize the threat of plastic pollution to the marine environment for future generation. Thus, we advocate 
more of enhance for the global and regional efforts to, the, to address plastic pollution in the marine environment and further strengthen international legal instruments for addressing plastic pollution in the marine environment. We, the young leaders who have committed to efforts to resolve the global marine plastic waste issue, hereby declare the following issues and concerns on the basis of our joint findings on issues related to marine plastic waste with respect to the specific recommendations we make for our leaders. Thank you very much to the six future leaders who read the declaration on behalf of all future leaders. Now, we are moving to signing the declaration. Are you ready? Please take out the document and sign declaration document. We now have witnessed the lifetime moment for these future leaders who will exercise their commitment to bring about the changes in the society and in the world in their endeavors to resolve the issue of marine plastic waste. Please let us congratulate again. Congratulations to our future leaders. Now, please allow me to welcome back our keynote speaker, Professor Kajita, to deliver his address on the declaration. Professor Kajita, please. On November 14, last year, I had the privilege to open the, this program on Future Leaders Declaration on ASEAN-Japan Cooperation for International Marine Plastic Waste as a keynote speaker. Um, orchestrated by the ASEAN-Japan Center. At the time, I emphasized to the future leaders the essence of global team building and collaboration in the field of science. Science is increasingly, increasingly manifested in enhanced and accelerated globalization efforts. Further, I illustrated how I have tackled my researches thus far in my attempt to articulate that any professional person who would like to change the society or the status quo needs to retain in passion and to keep challenging with um, patience and perseverance. Within only four months since then, I'm very pleased to see that all the future leaders who participated in this program from Japan and ASEAN countries are now equipped with such <laughs> traits to be an effective change maker in the society. Today, I'm personally delighted to be reunited with the future leaders after their hard work on this declaration. To future leaders, what you did by developing this declaration will be a stepping stone and a foundation for you to act upon your passion 
and scientific assumptions and to change the society with respect to the issue of marine plastic waste. I'm deeply impressed with the future leader's declaration on ASEAN-Japan cooperation for international marine plastic waste. Marine plastic waste is one of the most serious problems for humankind today. We have to take every possible action on this problem now. In the declaration, the future leaders from ASEAN and Japan summarized issues, express, expressed concerns on the marine plastic waste, and gave thoughtful recommendations. I fully support the declaration by young, fresh mind. I hope that all people, including those from uh, national and local governments, private sectors, and academia, read the declaration and act as stated in the declaration. I also hope that ASEAN Japan Center continues to be a part of the process of implementing the declaration. Congratulations to the future readers, and I look forward to seeing you implementing your aspirations in the society and the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kajita, for supporting our future leaders and the declaration. We greatly appreciate your enormous contributions to this program. Now, it is a great privilege to have the presence of Professor Atsuhiko Isobe for this program, who extended his extremely generous mentorship and guidance to our future leaders during the preparatory sessions. Professor Isobe is a professor of Center for Ocean and Atmospheric Research at Kyushu University, and he is one of the most prominent experts in Japan in the field of marine plastic waste, tackling numerous cross-sectoral projects among the public, private, and academic sectors. Please allow me to invite Professor Isobe to deliver his address on the declaration. Professor Isobe. Please. Thank you, very, thank you very much for a kind introduction for me. And congratulations to future leaders to make this a future leaders declaration on ASEAN Japan Cooperation for International Marine Plastic Waste. As introduced by Amano san, I am a physical oceanographer. I'm an oceanographer who studies the marine plastic litter about uh, 13 years before, 14 years before. At that time, um, very few researchers, and as well as uh, people in, uh, in the world, has no concern with the marine plastic litter. And only a part of the people is very concerned with marine plastic litter and litter on uh, massive plastic litter uh, is accumulated on the beaches. But uh, we start to study the marine plastic litter step by step with the cooperation of uh, people around the world. So very fortunately, but unfortunately, marine plastic litter is still a still, still very serious problem. But uh, fortunately, we now I we have uh, many cooperative uh, people who study or who work with us, including you. Today, uh, I was uh, working as a mentor of this uh, project, but probably you know, and I deeply understand, my contribution was very very small. I'm a physical oceanographer, so I just make uh, lectures and. Uh, to have uh, some advice in discussing the, on the only viewpoint of the sciences. However, I deeply enjoyed discussion with all of you because you all very cool and very active to make uh, this declaration 
And I'm enjoying to establish this declaration uh, step by step. But I, that, at the time, I found that, uh, so you know that this declaration is very, very comprehensive declaration, not only the science, not only the politics, not only the economics, but very comprehensive declaration. This comprehensive product is made from all of you, coming from many countries and many communities and many universities who study different, study, uh, different researches. I think this diversity makes the declaration very, very fruitful and very variable. I, I also can find, in, in cooperating with you, I, I also can find that the important keyword is the diversity. diversity. Only diversity makes your work bigger in the future. So I have a, a next uh, panel discussion in this ceremony. At that time, I'm very enjoyed to uh, discuss with you again. And hopefully, you read us to go ahead to reduce marine litter with the cooperation and with the diversity. This is a message from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Isobe, for serving as the mentor uh, for our future leaders. And your guidance will most definitely be imprinted in their hearts and minds. We'll now have a screenshot photo for this session. On the count of three. One, two, three. One more time, on the count of three. One, two, three. Now we move to session three, the panel entitled, What Future Leaders May Learn from Present Leaders. Today, we have the privilege to welcome the distinguished panelists, Professor Kajita and Professor Isobe, together with two additional inspiring panel members who are highly recognized for their works in the environmental sector. Please welcome Dr. Motoyuki Suzuki, Representative Director, Japan Association for United Nations Environment Program, and Ms. Yuko Koshishi, Senior General Manager, Corporate Sustainability Department of Santry Holdings Limited, who also represents CLOMA, Japan Clean Ocean Material Alliance. To the all the panelists, we like to express an equivocal appreciation for your participation in the panel today. We open this panel with each of the panelists' presentations, and we'll have a dialogue with the participation from four of our future leaders. We have requested the panelists to share their perspectives on leadership in the environment and scientific fields with our future leaders and the young generation, enabling them to learn from today's panelists who are the present leaders in the fields. Professor Kajita, we are thrilled to hear about your career and leadership achievements, and we'd like to learn from you as to how you developed your career, which led to your Nobel Prize Award. Okay. Thank you. Well, shall I? <laughs> okay, I, I, I come here. Okay. Well, since I have already spoken a lot, so I, I, I think this part I'm going to be short. Well, first uh, I was asked to talk about how the panelist gained her, uh, his or her leadership position. And, what, mm, well, okay, I can. Aspirations, dear panelists, 
had when he or she was developing career. Well, in November, I, I, I gave a talk and I said that I have been working in underground Kamioka, Japan, to study neutrinos. That is the small, mysterious elementary particle and gravitational waves in my career as a scientist. It's a very difficult question to answer how the panelist gained his leadership position. I think I only worked hard for science as a member of the collaboration or collaborations. And people sometimes asked me to take the leadership and typically I accepted to do so. Well, so I think this may not be the good answer anyway. And my goal, uh, aspiration was to enjoy the development of science. If possible, I wanted to contribute to the development of science. Therefore, I enjoyed the research activities very much. I really spent a lot of time for my research when I was young. And at present, I, I'm afraid I have no time to, for, for science. <clears throat> OK, um, the, in, in this page, the question is, anything the panelist would like to share uh, as the present leader with future leaders, including concerns, advice, lessons learned, and uh, expectations toward future leaders? Well, certainly, uh, human activities have become so powerful. And these activities significantly affect the nature on the Earth. And in my talk this morning, I referred the Budapest Declaration in 1999. And in the 21st century, we realized that some of the problems, such as the marine plastic waste, are even more serious than expected at the end of the 20th century. And of course, another very serious problem is the uh, global warming or climate change. And these problems, problems cannot be solved by scientists only. On the other hand, these problems cannot be solved without science. So it's clear that scientists should work for society. And I hope that future leaders will continue to take the responsibility to solve the problem of the marine plastic waste. An important part of the responsibility should be to carry out various scientific researches to know the uh, scientific or fundamental ways to reduce the marine plastic waste. OK, that's all from me. Thank you very much, Professor Kajita. Dr. Suzuki, thank you very much for joining us today. And we look forward to hearing your perspectives on your presentation entitled to Wish for Future Leadership in Establishing Sustainable Human Activities on the Finite Earth. Dr. Suzuki, please. Thank you very much. I'm glad to have this chance to talk with young leaders from Asian countries. And uh, I would like really to congratulate the completion of this declaration. And probably uh, Professor Isobe had a hard time, and Professor Kajita emphasized the importance of science, and that is going to be 
really important in various areas. What I'd like to give is to reconfirmation of the environmental status and also marine plastics is one of the topics in them. And uh, I wish all the future leaders or young leaders uh, to, to become really leading a sustainable human activities on the limited capacity of finite earth. And as all, most of the people in the environmental area understand that we have three crises or three emergencies. One is climate change, of course, global warming. And uh, nature crisis means biodiversity loss. And also pollution, like marine plastics and uh, many other mercury issues and so on. Now, all those things are interrelated, very much connected uh, each other. And uh, at the background of those crises, we have, as Professor Kajita already told, the population increase. That's all of you know. Later, I will show a graph, but the market economy drives economic development. And all the people so far had believed that the economic development is the most important thing in the world. Is that so? And the rapid urbanization, many people got together in the city. And that destroyed uh, natural uh, by ecosystem and also increased energy consumption. And uh, we uh, completely were uh, accustomed to the un un unsustainable consumption and production. And all those things suffered Nat natural biodiversity or species loss, endangered, well, especially endangered species. And also that type of thing altogether brought about deep inequality on the, on the world. And marine plastics is one of the symbolic issue uh, from these uh, problems. And this is a very famous uh, wood print from Hokusai, uh, Katsushika. It was prepared about 300 years ago. And now this is a little bit caricatured uh, by the North Carolina scientist. She's an artist, but uh, uh, also a marine scientist, Bonnie Metteroni, based in North Carolina. OK, during these 50 years, world population increased double, double in only 50 years. And in order to, well, suppose this population increase, nitrogen fertilizer produced industrially also is in parallel increased. But if we look at economy, GDP has increased, as the world GDP, global world pro product, more than 10 times, you know? during these 15 years, about 30 times. And if you look at the plastic production in the world, it's all, almost parallel to the, the economic development. So we used plastics as a symbol matter for the uh, world, uh, maybe development or progress. Is that not sure. Uh, as all of you know, Gaia and Jambek and Lowe 
Uh, those are the marine scientists based in Eastern uh, United States. And they estimated the accumulative flow of plastic materials. Plastics production started from 1950, around that time, after the World War II. And until 2015, primary production of plastics was 8,300 million ton, 8 billion ton. And it is used and in stock in the world in our life, uh, only 2,500. And some very small amount are recycled. And discarded amount becomes more than half of the production of 4.9 a billion ton. And that is the most important part. Some of them are on the land, maybe uh, just discarded, and some of them flow into the sea, marine. And the incinerated part is only 10% of the production. And please look at this discarded amount. If we have this discarded plastics on the, on the earth and in the ocean, that's 4.9 billion ton. And if you prepare plastic bag of 10 microns thickness, then this gives the area of five times 10 to the eight square kilometer. What is this amount? This is exactly the same as a surface of the globe. So you can, so far, if you can collect all the discarded plastics on the earth, you can prepare a garbage bag that is just enough for the globe. I don't like to see the globe as a garbage. But that, that is the situation so far. And for, the, for solving all those issues at the same time is very important. And I would like to give some remarks to young uh, leaders, future leaders. You need a holistic approach, not one at a time, but three problems, three crises should be addressed together and try to be solved at the same time. That's very important from now. And sustainability, well, the world is unsustainable now. Of course, we cannot expect to, our life to, to, to remain one billion years from now, but <laughs> only maybe 50 years, we will have a very difficult issue. So many people are considering at, by 2050, carbon emissions should be neutral or something like that. But we need to think really uh, change the whole uh, social system or production system, lifestyle and so on. And that is not to be the incremental, but that really a holistic approach is necessary. And we like to see the solutions at upper stream not at the end of pipe. And I will show you later a picture. And also nature-based solution. To live with nature is also is extremely important from now. And this is one of my favorite picture prepared by Professor Takatsuki, my same generation's professor at Kyoto University. We try to think about how to recycle or reduce or reuse. But just if you keep just running out the top at the top, it's really useless. The important thing is to stop the bulb at the upper stream. And that is uh, the picture prepared more than 20 years ago. And I still uh, prefer uh, to, to enjoy this uh, picture. And for the problems, 
uh, understood uh, worldwide. And uh, just uh, three weeks ago, we had a United Nations Environmental Assembly at Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, at that assembly, one report was released. That is this, making peace with nature. And that's about 160 pages report, but uh, it gives a scientific blueprint to tackle the climate and biodiversity and pollution emergencies. So that is the direction from now. And uh, next generation should bear to that. Current problems, our generation are responsible, but your generation should solve that. So leadership, maybe future leadership, is very much important. And uh, I was asked to, from the secretary to give some kind of idea about leaders. And one of my favorite words is, a leader is best when people barely know he exists. When his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. That is a word from Lao Tzu, old Chinese uh, philosopher. And this is very important. Don't just prove the people, or, you know, but, but let them do by themselves. And that is a real leader. And if I can, I'll give you another thing, uh, which is I also like. The function of leadership is to produce more leaders, not more followers. So leaders should, OK, uh, I don't need to say, but uh, uh, with this word, I'd like to uh, close my uh, address. Congratulations. Dr. Suzuki, thank you very much for your profound message with the realistic statistics and compelling need of leadership to act immediately for solving the issue of marine plastic waste by the future leaders. Today, we have a, a privilege extremely privileged to have Ms. Koshishi to uh, hear from you today uh, on both as Kloma representative and Santri in it, their activities as to how these two well-recognized organizations are tackling with the issue of marine plastic waste. Ms. Koshishi, please. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm Yuko Koshishi from Suntory Holdings, Japan, today representing Kloma. And first of all, I would like to congratulate the future leaders for a great work behind today's declaration and also the success of today's launch. And also, I would like to thank the, um, the secretary for inviting me here today. And this is such an honor to be here, as well as to be part of the panel of such a great presence. So I know that today I'm the only one from the business sector and have been thinking about what I should present, but um, I would like to today show, make a quick presentation, introduction about the Cloma itself and Suntory, what Suntory does for the plastics, um, tackling the plastics issue. And um, hoping that this could hopefully um, explain what the business well, business world, the business team is um, trying to show the leadership in order to tackle on this global issue. So the quick introduction of Cloma. I believe that this, um, perhaps this information you already know, and apologies for duplication, but the Cloma itself, um, this is an alliance 
Japan Origin Alliance, which was established in 2019. And it's a new platform that helps a wide variety of cross-sectorial stakeholders to collaborate and accelerate innovation for preventing plastics flowing into the ocean. And CLOMA endeavors to accelerate innovation for the three R, that is reduce, reuse, and recycle, and also alternative materials, and to encourage extensive plastic recycling through public-private partnerships. And it also aims to disseminate its Japan model, a made in Japan solution that aims to reduce plastics litter into uh, flowing into the ocean in cooperation with the consumers and society. And the chart here indicates on the right hand side, um, CLOMA's scope is to closing the recycling loop for preventing, preventing plastic waste flowing into the ocean. And to do so, companies from wide range of industries as you can see here in the chart, like chemical materials, recycling, um, recyclers, continuous manufacturers, brand owners, retailers, um, from the various industries here participate in CLOMA, bringing in their expertise. And CLOMA itself also envisioned to partner with governments, NGOs, and consumers for scaling up and making an impact. As of today, over 300 Japanese companies participate in CLOMA. And within CLOMA, there are five key action groups. Um, from here, reducing plastic consumption, improving the rate of material recycling, developing and disseminating chemical recycling, developing and disseminating biodegradable plastics, and also developing and disseminating paper and solace materials. And each of the working group is led by a member company and it also sets the target for 2030, which is in alignment with the Japan government's um, target, and for some, 2050 vision. Although CLOMA is um, originated in Japan, it envisioned to disseminate its Japan model worldwide, a Japan made in Japan solution, such as standardization of environmentally compatible design. And CLOMA already established the Indonesian Working Group, Indonesian Corporation Working Group, um, currently working together with the uh, NPAP Indonesia. NPAP is a National Plastic Action Partnership, uh, which is um, dedicated to solving the problems in Indonesia. And this partnership itself has been formed on the World Economic Forum. So CLOMA is working closely with another global um, alliance in order to solve the regional, um, in order to find the regional solution. And it also envisioned to extend its cooperation to the other Asian countries in the future. And a quick introduction about Suntory Group, where I am from. So Suntory is a beverage company originated in Japan, um, founded in 1899. And this with a wide uh, portfolio from soft drinks to spirits, wine, and beer. And um, although we originate in Japan, we currently operate in Americas, Europe, and of course, in Asian countries. And we have our business operations in Singapore, Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia. And we have a mission. As a corporate mission, we have a corporate mission called to create harmony with people and nature. And also as a company that use a lot of plastic bottles for our beverage products, we believe that it is a responsibility to seriously tackle to this global plastic issue. And we have established Suntory Glue Plastic Policy in 2019, which, um, which is showing the aspiration to show a strong leadership for transforming into recycling-oriented and zero-carbon society. And for, to do so, we have set four pillars, recycling renewable, reduce and replacement, supported by innovation, and also new behavior. And this chart shows some of the works that we do, but based on this plastic policy, we aim to switch all our PET bottles used globally for Suntory products to be made of only recycled or plant-based materials by 2030, and thus achieving zero usage of virgin petroleum-based materials. Of course, it is very important that um, before recycling, it is very important that we reduce as much as we can. So we've been working on lightweighting the packaging material, the plastic bottles, and we've been able to have the weight of the bottles compared to 20 years ago. 
And also in terms of recycling, we aim to close the loop so that we can prevent the litters flowing into the ocean or to the nature environment. And we were the first company in Japan to develop and install a B2B recycling system. B2B is um, standing for bottle to bottle. So this is about making new plastic bottles from the, pla from the used plastic bottles. And um, in addition to taking a step further, we recently launched a company called R Plus Japan together with 12 uh, cross-sectorial Japanese companies in the plastic value chain, which is working on to develop the technologies for um, recycling the used plastics, not limited to PT bottles, but also plastic packaging such as um, plastic bags, plastic containers for food, into the new materials that can be used for another plastic bags or plastic containers. So we're working to to develop this technology, which goes beyond just P PT bottles, but which will be applicable to more wider uh, plastic materials. And I must say that um, because we're talking about the leadership here, I would like to um, mention that all these efforts, um, either Coloma or Santori, would not have been able to um, make the scale of being successful without collaboration with the partners or the um, other companies who have who share the same similar aspiration. And as I mentioned, within Cloma, there are over 300 Japanese companies working together. And unless um, these companies come together, uh, probably we will, not be, we will not be able to come up with multiple solutions. So I think there wouldn't be just one silver bullet to um, really solve this global issue, but it's very important that we see from multiple ways, and to do so, having a multiple um, companies, stakeholders work together will bring in different aspects and perspectives and expertise. And um, also for Centauri, this R Plus Japan is one of the examples that really shows that how important it is to work together with the companies, not in the, with us in the same industry, but beyond the same industry, and even with the competitors. Um, R Plus Japan, actually, we work together with another beverage company as well. So it's not just only about competition, but really the collaboration. And, um, so once again, for the leadership, I think there, I would say that um, leaders will not be able to achieve just by oneself, but really um, bringing in the other's expertise will make a bigger impact. And I really expect all you future leaders with your bright faces, and I, I have no doubt that you will be able to achieve such a great leadership and um, wish you all the luck. Thank you so much. TC, thank you very much for your comprehensive and thorough explanations on Colomas and Santri's uh, enormous collaboration scheme, as well as your perception on leadership of importance of bringing other leaders into the same field. Now we welcome back Professor Isobe for his persuasive insights into the leadership as a scientist. Professor Isobe, please, thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, I, had, uh, I have had uh, lectures and discussions with you in this program. But uh, I, I found that uh, I forgot to send you, I forgot to give you one important message. Today, I, uh, I'd like to uh, give you the, the message that I forgot to say to you. So this is a very famous novelist in the United States in the hard world, you know? Uh, his name is Raymond Chandler. I, I, I like his word. He, he said that if I was not hard, I would not be alive. If I could not be, uh, ever be gentle, I would not deserve to be alive. To simply say, he said that uh, if you are not hard, hard means strong, you are not strong, you cannot arrive in the world. But simultaneously, if you are not gentle, you are not gentle, you should not arrive. 
This is a very important message, and I sometimes replace this wording in a I replace with scientist. If a scientist was not heard, she or he would not be alive. If the scientist could ever be gentle, she or he would not deserve to be alive. Okay, let's talk about the topic regarding the plastics. So we have many plastic products in everyday life, in our everyday life, because plastic is very, very convenient and very unpolluted and very cheap. So please consider that uh, if we don't have a plastic bottle, it's very difficult to com it's difficult to carry the unpolluted water a long distance. If we don't have uh, any plastic films, it's very difficult to cover the food to be remained unpolluted. Plastic is very convenient. And we, we deeply understand the convenience of the plastic in everyday life. However, simultaneously, uh, it has been uh, well recognized that the plastic is a very, very serious and pollut pollutant. Plastic is a very serious pollutant in our science, uh, our environment. You can find that the plastic litter covering over the beach, over the beach in the world, in the world. For example, in the case of the Japan, about 0.1 million tons of the plastic is covering over the beach, a Japanese beach. And these plastics sometimes entangled to the wildlife, wild, wild animal, wildlife. And sometimes, uh, so, no, not sometimes, always, these plastic fragmentized to the small pieces, saying microplastics. This microplastic is always very uh, harmful to a wildlife, including, the, including from the very tiny plankton to the big mammals. So we have to reduce this kind of the pollutant from the oceans. Probably almost all people agree with me to reduce this plastic pollution in the world. The scientists to date have elucidated the, uh, so, threat of the marine plastics. For example, so many scientists uh, conducted laboratory-based studies how the plastic bees are harmful harmful and uh, dangerous to the uh, marine, uh, marine or uh, aquatic biota, using, in, 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 uh, adding the plastic, piece to, plastic pieces to the, uh, to in, to, to, to the uh, marine aqu uh, aquatic biota, marine biota for ingesting. And if uh, scientists have elucidated that if the plastic concentration, microplastic concentration is larger than one gram per cubic meter in the seawater. In this case, the marine biota, uh, aquatic biota living in this polluted water may show damage. So we have to, uh, we don't have to realize this kind of the polluted water with plastics in the future, in the future. So scientists have to be hard to uncover the truth. We, I, for example, for, in, in the case of me, I uh, attended the observational cruise during the several months and uh, so walking the tropical beach a long distance to measure the plastic debris amount or uh, uh, study hard using the numerical modeling to elucidate this kind of the future. So scientists to be hard to uncover the truth in every, in every so research field, in every research field. However, we have to recognize the plastics give us unpolluted everyday life at a low cost, at a low cost. We have to recognize that the plastic is not material for rich people in wealthy classes over the world. Real, but the plastic is material for relatively poor people over the world. If we rapidly discard the plastics in the world, this may also show damage to relatively weak people, weak people. So 
Now we are establishing to make action plan to reduce the plastic every day from everyday life to avoid marine plastic pollution. We have to establish a sustainable action plan to reduce plastic in everyday life with, with scientific evidence. Scientists should be gentle so that no one will be left behind. As I said, scientists should be hard to reach the truth. The simultaneously, scientists should be gentle so that no one will be left behind. I think that this is a very, uh, I, I, in my op in personal opinion, this is a very important uh, message for all scientists. And also, this wording, in this wording, scientists or I should be replaced with the readers, future readers. This is my message and this is my asking to the future readers, our future readers. If a reader was not heard, she or he would not be alive. If a reader could not ever be gentle, he or she would not uh, deserve to be alive. Congratulations for establishing this great uh, declaration. This experience, I hope this ex experience make you very hard and make you very gentle in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your profound message uh, to, regarding uh, how scientists need to be gentle, uh, also the leaders. Having heard from the inspiring present leaders, future leaders, please briefly comment on your aspirations and what you would like to take away from today's panelist presentation. I'd like to start out with Machiko. Please. Uh, thank you for your valuable presentations. Uh, I was very impressed by what Professor Isobe said. Uh, scientists should be gentle so that no one will be left behind. The phrase, uh, leave no one behind, is also said in the SDGs. And uh, cheap plastics supports our convenient and safe daily lives. So I also think it is important to uh, reduce marine plastic waste based on uh, scientific evidence uh, rather than rapid reduction of uh, marine plastic a reduction of plastic uses. So uh, in my laboratory, we are studying about the microplastics in the atmosphere. And I've just started my research, but I will, I will uh, enjoy my research. And uh, I would, uh, and I would like to be involved in the promotion of the research on marine plastic waste. And in addition, through events like today's, I want to let more people know about the marine plastic waste program. And finally, um, I will keep our today's present leader's messages in mind, and uh, I will continue my effort to be a good leader who is uh, hard and gentle like you are in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Machiko. Um, thank you. Um, I just would like to uh, congratulate on these four um, future leaders who will also participate in our program for next year, uh, fiscal year's program. And um, I'd like to now move on to um, Bandus, if you'd like to make comments. Uh, thank you, Amano san uh, First of all, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Asian Japan Center for this opportunity 
the opportunity that we, I mean, the Asian mem member, represent, Asian state representative, that we, we meet each other and we learn from each other. And also the opportunity that we uh, meet with our distinguished guests, delegates, uh, like uh, Professor Isobe, like uh, Dr. Suzuki, Dr. Katjita, and also the uh, company representative, uh, Ms. Uh, Koshi Ishi. Yes, so I'm, I'm so happy that the, uh, for this opportunity. And I would like to express a little bit about uh, my personal interest. You know, uh, as an Asian citizen, I mean, we are living in the, uh, the, the country we are underdeveloping, or we call, we call least developed countries. So coming to Japan is like our dream, you know, because uh, we see uh, uh, any projects uh, uh, run by Japanese company in our country, we see very, very good uh, quality. So. It, it made me feel uh, curious and keen to come to Japan to, to, learn, to learn more. And we, we think that uh, this quality may be, may be from uh, education. So that's why from uh, our pre uh, preparatory meetings and uh, uh, Asian Center, Asian Japan Center facilitation, we developed uh, a project, an environment, environmental education project uh, between Japan and uh, Asian. So we hope that uh, from this project, uh, I mean uh, the, the people in, uh, in the two regions, Asian and Japan, I mean, their capacity will be improved. And as uh, mentioned by our distinguished guest delegates, there will be more uh, participation from them into uh, plastic waste uh, management. So uh, finally, uh, once again, I would like to appreciate uh, uh, your uh, comment, for example, like uh, from Dr. Kajita, yeah. You, I, I, I hear two, two, two key points. That first is work hard, and, or, and also Professor Isobe, uh, work, work hard you know, and enjoy working. Yes. So this is uh, the two key points that I will take away from in the future. Yeah? And also from Dr. Suzuki, I learned the, the you, you said about the holistic approach. I mean the the three crises, nature crisis. Uh, pollution crisis and also climate crisis. We should address these three crises all together at the same time. So um, uh, this is very very uh, helpful for for us and also for the company that I mean their con contribution to uh, uh, environmental sustainability. Yes, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Vandos, for uh, touching upon on the importance of education. Next year, we will be launching uh, fellow uh, future leaders uh, educating next future leaders, which I will explain later in, um, in this session. Um, now we have uh, some questions uh, from our future leaders to the present leaders. So please, Tian. Uh, please uh, ask a question to Ms. Koshishi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, to own for uh, present leaders. I think uh, I really enjoy uh, all your presentations. And uh, in particular, I uh, have a question to Ms. Koshishi and uh, regarding to uh, the Suntory Group and also CLOMA's uh, plastic uh, uh, policy implementation. So uh, during your implementation, is there any challenges that you have to face, especially during this time of the pandemic, whether the COVID-19 pandemic is an obstacle to your progress? So I'm really curious about that. Thank you so much. 
Well, thank you so much for question and interest towards and towards and Coloma's activity. Um, to your question, I would say there was not a major impact to the, our policy or activities uh, during the COVID-19. Um, the, one of the reasons is because um, the Coloma itself was established in 2019, and Suntory Group also established a plastic policy in 2019, which was before the COVID-19 crisis. And um, this is the policy itself is not a short term, but more the long term vision and it sets the direction of what we need to tackle on. So with this all being set, um, we've been able to you know, proceed, make progress to uh, with our activities, even though um, despite the Corona uh, COVID-19 pandemic, I would say that if one major obstacle that we have faced could be um, that we've been not able to travel between the countries. So sometimes it may have been difficult for us to actually really understand the situation. Um, on the ground activity may have been a little bit of, um, tough, but all in all, um, there was not major major um, obstacle. But at the same time, I would like to address that during this COVID-19, um, as uh, Professor Isobe said about the, how useful the plastics, there's both sides of the plastics, the usefulness and also the how it could harm the environment. And during the crisis, um, we've seen a lot of the benefits of plastic itself for the safety and also the um, availability. And perhaps this may have, um, this was a could, we could say that this could be this could have been a bright side for the plastic industry itself. However, it doesn't really mean that um, then it, we can just leave it as it is. But if we also have to um, be responsible that uh, while providing the benefits of the plastics, we also have to be responsible for how it will be um, taken care of after its usage. So that is a point probably um, ha also has been highlighted through this COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Koshishi, for your answer to Tien. Uh, we have another question from Shelby uh, to Dr. Suzuki. Shelby, please. Thank you very much for this uh, chance. So Dr. Suzuki, considering your remarkable experiences, so could you tell us, the future leader, how would you describe the cooperation between Japan and ASEAN, especially combating the marine plastic debris in the ocean. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I think that the Japan and Asia as a very uh, important countries in the broad area of Asia. We have lots of, well, probably the population size is the biggest in the, in the world, Asian countries. So we do not uh, need to single out just the Asian or ASEAN, but we have to think about Asian countries as a whole. And Asian countries has a, a very good traditions for sustainability. If we compare with uh, African continent or uh, Europe or even uh, American continents, uh, because we have lots of, uh, still lots of uh, rich biodiversity, natural system. And we have very a good tradition from the historical uh, era. Uh, we lived uh, together with nature. So don't forget that culture. For instance, you were maybe in Vietnam or in other area, you, you can use banana leaves instead of plastics. And why don't you keep that uh, tradition and uh, try to use cheap uh, plastics and that destroys your traditional culture? 
So we have many things in common in Asian area, and Japan has lost many uh, good traditions, but we can recover, and we can learn from Asian countries. So we work together and establish the a very sustainable style of lifestyle in Asian countries. And that will maybe uh, be a, a good example, best example for other areas of the world. So anyway, uh, we have to think about what is the real sustainable human activities, not just get the economical reach or unsustainable consumption and production and that type of life, but we have to, we have to start from now to think about, uh, well, try to keep Asian traditions, Asian way of thinking, because as I said, Lao Tzu, but other Buddhist ideas, they live with nature. They don't refuse. They live with nature. And that is very important and probably uh, make friend or make peace with nature means how to find a way for a human to, to you know, uh, work together or live with the natural system. And for that, Japan and Asia, ASEAN countries can cooperate and uh, or you can teach us uh, how, how to you know, uh, get rid of this uh, mechanical, artificial way of living and return back to natural, sustainable system. That's, uh, is that satisfied? <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Suzuki, for your explanations um, how the importance of uh, culture uh, filters into how we resolve uh, the problem in the world. Now, uh, to, uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Isobe a question. Uh, in today's opening remarks, uh, ASEAN Secretariat, Secretary General has emphasized the importance of cross-sectorial collaboration among the public, private, and academic sectors. Professor Isobe, you have extensive experience in this area, and would you kindly describe your experience uh, or achievement, which you think is the best collaboration model among the government, the private sector, and the academia? Uh, sorry, I don't have a, so, not so many experience. I'm just seeking the best way for that collaboration. So, you know, now I'm working as a principal investigator of the uh, uh, one research product, pro, uh, research project in Thailand. Uh, with uh, researcher in Thailand and researcher, of course, Japanese and Thailand government and supported by the Japanese government. At the time, we have to seek the best way to reduce the marine plastic litter, uh, sustainable reduction, and uh, very gentle for the people, not so serious for the poor people. It's a very difficult way, it's a very difficult challenge to find the best way to. Uh, release the marine plastic litter as a, uh, with a sustainable action plan. Um, policy maker has, can only policy maker can decide the policies. Um, but the policy maker always have to explain that reason of the policy to the people in the uh, nations or people in the communities. I think only a scientist can uh, provide uh, such uh, reasonable uh, reasonable uh, necessity or uh, some reason, uh, some reasons for that policy. So we can support, we can support to the policy makers to choose their policies, which is the the suitable for the sustainable action plan uh, in their communities, in their community. But first of first of all, I think a scientist should enjoy their science first. I think so. so that the science make a very, very fruit, make, uh, become very fruitful. And also, Professor Kajita say we are not independent of the society. So we have to contribute 
the, 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 um, the, the community or our, our nations, our, our countries. So if our science can contribute to the policy makers, policy decisions, I think it's so happy. So this kind of the relationship that the policy makers and our scientists support by our science is the uh, best or ideal relationship. But so, I'm sorry, I, it, it's not a so good question, good answer. I'm just seeking the best way for, for the uh, relationship, uh, our cooperations among the scientists and private sectors and the scientists. It's very difficult questions. Thank, thank you very much for answering this difficult question. Uh, I greatly appreciate your explanation about scientist law, uh, how it needs to be rationalized with the policies which uh, policymakers need to explain to the society of why policymakers do uh, things in the way they do. And also, uh, kindly uh, uh, appreciate about uh, scientists needs to enjoy the science. That's a very profound message. And I think it goes to all of the leaders who needs to understand enjoyment and passion for what we day to day do. Now I'd like to uh, turn to Professor Kajita. Uh, definitely uh, last question, but definitely not least question uh, to Professor Kajita, our inspiration and dignity of the program. What is the most crucial aspect that you keep in mind when you are developing young leaders? Okay, thank you very much for this question. Well, I have been working in scientific in the scientific community. And in these communities, everyone carries out research based on his or her scientific interest or curiosity. Therefore, to me, the most crucial thing to communicate with the young readers is they get more interest in their research or science after we communicate. In my opinion, all the other things are typically rather minor. Well, certainly this is based on my experience, but I think the interest in your job is the most important thing for, for everything, not only for science, but for all other, all other works. So, young future leaders here today. I, I hope that you develop your career keeping the interest in the marine plastic waste. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you very much for your uh, kind word, words about uh, keeping interest and the passion in the area. Um, now, before concluding the panel session, I'd like to um, briefly introduce uh, our next year's project. Now, having heard from all the panelists today, which are very inspiring and um, uh, profound, um, now I feel a responsibility as AJC next year to empower our future leaders to take on the action and change the society um, <coughs> through our program. So we have uh, next year uh, a pro project called Hiroshima ASEAN Eco School on Marine Plastic Education. We have seven uh, passionate uh, future leaders participating uh, who will be uh, joining us to make this uh, project come true. And objectives is to raise awareness of ASEAN students for marine plastic waste. Uh, with elementary school and high school, uh, we 
have targeted at the young age as well as the more advanced age. Uh, students in Hiroshima uh, to collaborate exchanges uh, with the uh, education in, and hopefully uh, our objective is to change behaviors of young uh, youth for waste management and contribute to ASEAN Japan Marine Corporation. And so what we'll be doing uh, in terms of activity is develop a, a curriculum and teach elementary and high school students, organize online symposium for exchanging experiences between Hiroshima and ASEAN schools, and conduct survey and analyze the behavior changes before and after the education. So prepare, implement, and change. That's our three steps. And uh, the implications for this uh, activity program is that future leaders empowering next future leaders. And it's a collaboration and joint efforts between ASEAN and Japan future leaders and also multi-generation empowerment from we were empowered by your generation now by to your generation and then now to the younger generation. And of course, cross-sector engagement and collaboration. And we will be having our uh, collaboration with Hiroshima ASEAN Association and CLOMA, uh, local governments, and um, professor at Kyoto University, Dr. Misuzu Asari, who will take on uh, in part, uh, educating us on the survey part, so the last part of the program. And uh, the reason we chose Hiroshima as the, of a pilot venue was that coincidentally, a lot of us are uh, rooted <laughs> from Hiroshima origin, uh, Fujikawa-san, and also Bandos is studying at University of Hiroshima, myself, and Mr. Takeshita from Kuroma, who gave a, a very excellent lecture uh, for the special seminar held in the, on 20th November. Uh, we, we thought this will be a good venue to start. And hopefully this pilot program uh, with the success, we'd like to uh, roll out this program to the en enlarged uh, territory of Japan and also ASEAN. Thank you very much. This concludes our panel uh, today. And uh, we'd like to now uh, <coughs> say thank you very much to all the distinguished present leaders and future leaders for the fantastic exchange of passion and constructive discussions. For our future leaders and the young generation viewing the ceremony today, this panel remains a lifetime event that will not be forgotten, on which they keep challenging and changing the society and the world. We'll now have a screenshot photo for this session on the count of three. One, two, three. One more time. One, two, three. Thank you very much. Let us um, uh, move to the closing remarks and we'll just have to rearrange the table. And
Let us turn to the closing remarks to be presented by ASEAN Japan Center Secretary General, Mr. Masataka Fujita. Secretary General, please. Your Excellencies, Dr. Dim Jok Hoi, Secretary General of the ASEAN Secretariat, Professor Kajita Takaki, Nobel Laureate, and the professors of the University of Tokyo, Dr. Suzuki Motoyuki, Representative uh, Directors of Japan Association for UNEP, Ms. Koshishi Yuko, uh, senior general managers of Santri Holdings, uh, Professor Isobe Atsuhiko, uh, professor of Kyushu University. Distinguished uh, online uh, guests uh, of the ministries and the diplomatic uh, delegations, distinguished online uh, participants uh, from the private sectors and the general public. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today uh, to celebrate the launch of the uh, Futures Leaders Declaration on ASEAN-Japan cooperation in, uh, interna for international marine plastic waste. It is my great uh, honor to witness the declarations uh, launched successfully. Since last November, uh, this declaration has been worked out by our 22 future leaders who uh, represent 10 ASEAN member states and Japan, being united under the common goals and commitment to resolve the global and regional issues of marine plastic waste. I can hardly express how much these future leaders were engaged in thought-provoking uh, discussions and uh, generated forward-looking uh, recommendations, which are addressed to all members of the society, including the government, the academia, the private sectors, and the general public. May I first congratulate our 22 future leaders for their remarkable achievement, and may I express my sincere appreciation to Professor Kajita for inspiring these future leaders from the onset, uh, from the outset of the programs, and to Professor Isobes for mentoring and guiding them throughout the program. Everyone, let us applaud to their phenomenal achievement. Congratulations. <laughs> we have today's 130 public viewers uh, from Japan and ASEAN countries on live. This figures is a sign of the increased attention in the issues of marine plastic waste. And I must emphasize that the world is compelled to tackle this issue with the greatest urgency and importance. Our declarations is uh, built upon the efforts and initiative developed by ASEANs in Japan under the ASEAN-Japan Environment Cooperation Initiatives ASEAN and Japan are deepening their cooperation in developing environment infrastructures such as waste management and recycling system. In addition, ASEAN released the Bangkok Declaration on Combating Marine Debris in 2019. As the regions 
has uh, recognized the increasing threat uh, posed by the presence of uh, microplastics in the ocean. And Japan and ASEAN issued the joint statement of the 23rd Japan ASEAN Summit on Cooperation on ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific or AOIP in November 2020 that identified marine debris, marine plastic debris as a possible areas for cooperation and the ASEAN Japan's strategic partnership to support AOIP. Today, during the panel, we are listening to the impressive narratives and perspectives of the present leaders as to how they have exercised their leadership and accomplished their achievement in their field. We are all inspired by their leadership, and I hope that especially our future leaders and the young, young generation of public viewers have learned from enriched experience and the wisdoms of the present leaders today. We, ASEAN Japan Centers, will continue to be a very keen and a thread to facilitate and support our future leaders to be immersed and flourished in their leadership positions, thriving on their commitment and aspiration in the field of marine plastic waste. We will work with our future leaders in fiscal year 2021 and onwards with a view to witnessing the involvement of leadership and the professional career through many years to come. As a first step, next year, the fiscal year 2021, as introduced during the panel discussions, we plan to implement a marine plastic education programs for schools in Hiroshima as a pilot program. And our future leaders will collaboratively develop a curriculums and teach these schools. Further, these education programs may also be rolled out on schools, onto schools in ASEAN uh, member states. I believe that today marked a special milestone for everyone who participated in the ceremonies with interest in the issue of marine plastic waste. We have felt the dynamism from both present leaders and the future leaders, the passion to solve the problem through science and through policy makings with respect to marine plastic waste. I wish all that you will deep dive into taking the leadership to address these global issues of marine plastic waste for the current and the future generations. Thank you very much again uh, for your participations. And to those who have contributed in realizing today's declaration ceremonies, I express my utmost appreciation for your constructive engagement, which contributed to further enhancing the ASEAN-Japan dialogue with respect to the field of marine plastic waste. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary General Fujita. We will now ask Secretary General, please be at the podium. We will now have a screenshot photo for this session. 
On the count of three. One, two, three. One more time. On the count of three. One, two, three. Thank you very much. And this concludes our ceremony today. Distinguished guests and participants, thank you very much again for participating in this ceremony. Just uh, please fill out the survey questions uh, that we submit to you in the email address. We greatly look forward to being joined sometime in the future with your leadership and initiatives in promoting and advancing the ASEAN Japan Marine Cooperation. Thank you. Now for those, those people who are here, we'll have a photo session at the stage. Thank you.